Hello, folks. Welcome to Between Awesome and Disaster. This is your host, Will Carey. I appreciate you tuning in. I hope you are doing well, staying safe, and uh, taking care of those closest to you, and uh, still finding some joy in the uh, in living in 2022. I'm very fortunate uh, and excited that I'm I'm here. Uh, I'm especially excited today. Uh, be it as as trivial as it is, but this is I'm recording this the day after it was officially announced that uh, Tom DeLonge, uh, not only a musical, my musical hero, but uh, a one of a few dream guests uh, for this podcast, has rejoined uh, my favorite band of all time, Blink One Eighty Two. There is a album on the way. There is a new song coming out in a couple of days, and there is a massive. Uh, world tour happening and I'm going and I'm really excited to be able to say that uh, I am absolutely uh, absolutely stoked I also want to because one of the things that I love to do is uh, is is play shows and and see shows that's like one of the things I miss the most and I'm now able to to do it uh, in a reasonably I, I feel reasonably like I'm making some calculated Risk, sure, but I feel reasonably safe in the precautions I've made and uh, the vax that I have. I do need to get the hurry-upping, and I do need to get the next booster, uh, so I will be doing that soon. So make sure you, if you're eligible, and I think everyone is, uh, for the your second booster, make sure you get it. Um, but I'm excited that my favorite band is back with my, uh, and it's, uh, and I'm going to say, and it's uh, key line up with Tom and the band. Uh, I also want to say I saw a great show over the weekend. I saw the Gaslight Anthem in New Jersey at the PNC Bank Arts Center, which was an incredible show. I had gotten tickets for it since the uh, Gaslight Anthem reunion tour was announced, um, I would say earlier this year, and I had been looking forward to this. Uh, My wife and I went, and it was the kind of show that like a huge fan of the band like myself would really appreciate it was a absolute amazing time they played all of my favorite deep cuts that i would not have expected to hear and they played all of my favorite uh favorite big songs as well so it was truly it was like the band went into my head and knew exactly uh what i wanted to hear uh and to see them in their home state uh on the, I believe the last concert of the season because PNC is outdoors, so it was, it was pretty chilly. Uh, and even though it was a bit of a, it took a while to get back home to New York City, uh, an absolute great time. So I'm happy I got to see, and I can't wait for their new album as well. Um, which brings me into even more excitement. Um, my guest on the show today is uh, Michael C. Uh, Morona, uh, who you might remember. Uh, as an actor from uh, movies like Home Alone and Home Alone 2. He was also Big Pete on uh, The Adventures of Pete and Pete, one of the uh, seminal uh, Nickelodeon shows of the 90s. Uh, He was also in the movie Slackers. And um, he hosts a great podcast with his Pete and Pete uh, co-star, The Adventures of Danny and Mike. And he has since uh, transitioned uh, into being an electrician uh, for uh, film and TV in the New York City area. Um, I reached out to him uh, via Twitter, and he w- said he would love to chat. Uh, he's a New York City guy as well, so I was uh, I always love talking uh, to native New Yorkers as as someone who has uh, a transplant to the city, but I've been here for uh, coming up on, I guess, 12 years now. Um, I, I love hearing stories uh, about uh, living in New York City and and especially in New York City in an era I can never experience it. So uh, uh, this is a, a pretty fun, pretty fun chat, pretty uh, heartfelt chat. And uh, I, I was I was a little, I'll, I'll be honest, I was a little nervous getting into into my my groove here. But I think uh, Mike and I, Michael and I, had a really excellent chat. And if you enjoy this and you're not listening uh, to Danny and Michael's podcast, uh, you should definitely check that out as well. And uh, if you are listening to this for the first time, uh, any uh, old school P&P fans, and you want to know more about this podcast, you can go to awesomedisaster.com and find out more about me. Uh, That is awesomedisaster.com and find out everything related to me. Uh, Podcast, stand-up comedy, band, acting. I do a lot of stuff. 
But uh, let's get into it and uh, let's talk uh, to Michael C. Morona. Um, well, since the since the pandemic, like I especially feel like a certain risk involved, like a certain level of calculated risk with any kind of like doing something in front of people. So when I want to do that, I want it to feel like like especially worthwhile. And especially I you probably not would have heard of this, but even once things kind of slowly started reopening up, I would hear about these sort of like bouts of COVID that would hit all of uh, like one comic would test positive and then that would bring down like a whole bunch of other comics I would hear of and that's just not like especially like I want the show to be really really good so like there's a certain level of risk that comes to like performing live even still now I feel right you're a you're a talented comic but you also have a robust uh, respiratory system so you're perfect for my next show (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I, I try, I, I try Michael. Um, but so, so like talking like a little bit about New York because you, you grew up in the city, right? I did. And, and where specifically in the, in the city did, did you grow up? I was born in Borough Park. I lived in a very segregated block that was like half Orthodox Jewish and half everyone else. Mm-hmm. And, uh, my mom's and dad's family both came from Windsor Terrace and Park Slope area, so I spent a lot of time going back and forth on Fort Hamilton Parkway between the two neighborhoods. Uh-huh. Later on, I moved to Queens. I was a little bit older, and uh, just after the Mets won the World Series, and um, and spent a lot of time there as well. I went to uh, Elementary, finished my elementary schooling there, and then we started going to high school in Manhattan while I was still living in Queens. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't mind me asking, just because my wife's born and raised in in Brooklyn as well, she's born oh. and raised in in Prospect Heights, and uh, to to live in sure. Queens, yeah, and so to live in Queens now, to go from being like a born and raised Brooklynite, I don't even know if that's the word, but to go from living in Brooklyn to living in Queens is like a major mm-hmm. divide. Did you feel that when you moved to Queens originally? I wasn't really aware of it. Um, I mean, I knew it was going to be further away from family um, and the friends that we had made on the block and stuff like that. I didn't mm-hmm. really keep up with it. too many of those friends. Uh, but I'm more sensitive to it now. <laughs> living, living in Brooklyn and getting uh, priced out of living in Brooklyn and you know, everybody ending up in Ridgewood, as it were, from Greenpoint, just like all the Polish people who live in Greenpoint who sold their houses and moved to queens oh my god my god yeah like queens is like the last kind of little tiny bastion like if gentrification is like the rising the rising tide on the titanic we're hanging on to like the last little bit of reasonable reasonable prices in uh don't don't sleep on the bronx the bronx is still the probably the most affordable neighborhood the most affordable borough there is um I don't I don't count Staten Island because really we should sell it to New Jersey and balance the budget. No. <laughs> I I I don't dis uh, I don't disagree with that. I haven't spent too much time in the Bronx other for other than for 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 sports, but like I love like like Queens, like I love going out to Flushing and just spending like an entire day walking around Chinatown and finding like cool like bow sandwiches and dumpling spots. That's like my Is your your girlfriend's a Yankee fan, so you have to go there? Is it the deal? Um well I'm a I'm a and I'm a NYCFC fan and we don't have a stadium Ooh, to play in. The worst. The worst. I mean I have no allegiance. I've been to I've been to a couple Red Bulls games, but I really couldn't. Uh-huh. Can't even say, but that's been it's been a long time. No, no, I, I since I, I've been to either. Mm-hmm. Go, go right ahead. Well. <laughs> oh no no oh, I'm 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 just I'm just saying I I know ex- exactly what, what you mean like we like we count like five or six home home stadiums as like our home stadium uh so I relate t- uh, to that so gr- so so m- more ag- akin akin to now but when you were growing up in in Brooklyn ori- originally what was kind of like the vibe of the neighborhood I I sort of romanticize um this era of new york of new york city that's like not quite the 70s but also not quite like the giuliani area as a sort of like sure. kind of like very sure. interesting I, magical I, time in new in the city 
I mean, we were uh, a metal trash can neighborhood as opposed to a plastic trash can neighborhood. Uh-huh. Think, of the, uh, think of those wire baskets that you see in the old, in the old uh, timey movies is what we had on the corner. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I say, my neighborhood was pretty segregated growing up in Borough Park, but I had like my best friend was um, Filipino. Uh, friends with a Norwegian girl, an Italian kid. I'm still in touch with the Norwegian and the Italian. Mm-hmm. Um, played video games around the corner at the Chinese candy store. That's where I learned to play Street Fighter, excuse me, Super Mario Brothers. Uh-huh. Um, I would go there and watch the kids hold it down for like an hour uh, with 50 cents zipped into my kangaroo, my kangaroo's uh, Velcro sneaks and come back home two hours later with having not spent any of the money because the kids were that good at uh, playing and they would just hold the machine down the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, the vibe. It was an interesting block that I lived on. Um, there was a public school directly across the street and the rest of that block was taken up by a large um, auto repair place. So mm-hmm. it, was not, it was not typical in that all the neighbors were on the same side of the street and uh, there was nothing going on in on that side when they but we had an entire schoolyard at our own um to do with what we liked so i grew up outside mostly running around and then eventually got into more video games and things like that Mm -hmm. having an acting career from being young i was also spending a lot of time on public transportation going back and forth into the city my parents would also drive us in when they could but uh, there was a lot of train rides back and forth to Midtown Manhattan to audition for things. Oh, sh- sure. So I got to so I got to see the city from that point of view. Um, <clears throat> I remember being fascinated by the uh, the Keith Haring uh, artwork in the train tunnels by Decal Avenue. Oh yeah, I actually like. I remember like. And this kind of a full circle way to kind of say this. I remember like finding out about Keith Haring through like bumpers on Nickelodeon back in the day, like in the like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. in like the Nicktoons era, they do like a little feature on like, this is Keith Haring and he would do these are, and I would just remember being so drawn to that, like bright, colorful, simplistic uh, art style, his little uh, stick figures he would do. That's awesome. Didn't, didn't go downtown for a long time, but when I did, yeah, pop shop was very cool. Um, being over in the village was uh, a later thing. I didn't really get over there down to, to the Lower East Side or to the village till I was uh, older. Mostly when I was younger, was confined to like Midtown, the theater district and wherever advertising was, Madison Avenue, like that. Sure. Um, so, so you're growing up, you're into, into video games and then, so like being a, a child actor, like how did that come about? Was that something you were pushing your parents to, that you wanted to pursue? How did acting start for you? So, so young. I think that they were just conscious of how much college costs and they didn't want to pay for it. I was <laughs> the, uh, I was the oldest grandchild. I was, my mother was the oldest of nine children and I was the first grandchild. So I got a lot of attention when I was young, a lot of attention. And I really liked it. I liked getting attention. So this was one way of uh, continuing to get attention was acting. Besides Mm -hmm. the fact that I liked reading and acting out and stuff like that. My aunt worked in advertising at the time and, uh, maybe got a tip or something like that about who was a talent manager and just started doing commercials when I was very young. I think my first commercial was when I was five years old and I joined SAG on the back of doing a couple of more commercials uh, than the following year. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's 1983. Awesome. Wow. So that, that's, that's like a very, I, I, I sort of, I, I, I dig your parents kind of, uh, approach to this because it's a like very kind of like almost practical approach to a career that like my parents would not consider, uh, practical at all. Um, that, that's, that's fascinating. So, so you're, so you're a kid, you, you do commercial, you're doing commercials and then you get in, you get into SAG and then 
and then, and then that that's that's how the acting career starts. Well, I joined the union and uh, also was uh, auditioning for theater and working on Broadway when I was younger. And mm-hmm. then I started doing films a little bit later than that. Uh, what what plays on Broadway did you do? Uh, the first play on Broadway that I did was an understudy role in a uh, fantastical laser light musical based upon the story of the Shroud of Turin, mm-hmm. which is a uh, you know a religious relic that was supposed to have been wrapped around Jesus after he was crucified. Mm-hmm. And I understudied uh, Danny Gerard, who you would know from the show Lost in Yonkers, if you knew that show, mm-hmm. which. You're not you're not registering any familiarity, but that was a that was no. a show that he did. I think I'm trying to remember. I think it was on AMC. Uh, and the star of the show was Dean Jones of the Herbie the Love Bug uh, movies fame. Okay, yes, I, I I do know Dean Jones. So there it was a good bunch of characters. Um, my experience was extremely limited, though, in that it was not the best show and. Uh, Frank Rich of the New York Times was just um, was just starting as a uh, a theater critic, and he wrote a real uh, a real ripper of a review, where I could say that the show almost like opened on a Tuesday and closed on a Friday type of thing. It was not it was oh, not man. long for Broadway, and it was you know quite an investment with these um, these green lasers everywhere in this projection screen and not something that I was really used to. My, you know, my mother was, my father both liked show tunes and stuff like that. So I had grown up on soundtracks and things. Uh, my uncle had worked on, was working on Cats at that point in my life. So mm-hmm. I had been to a few Broadway shows um, through, through the virtues of Local One. So that was my very first um, Broadway show. And then after that, I was cast in a, a Broadway sh- a remake of a revival of All My Sons, which is an Arthur Miller play about uh, World War II war profiteering. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I did a more modern play called Coastal Disturbances in the Circle and the Square Theater, which is probably my favorite Broadway theater to work in. This was a All My Sons was a lot of fun, too. Um, working with some bigger stars is fun. Um, <clears throat> Richard Kiley, Jamie Sheridan, and Stephen Root were the uh, were the standouts from that cast. And I managed to get chicken pox or something during that show, and they didn't have an understudy for me, so they just cut my part out oh, no. of the show. <laughs> and Jamie Sheridan is supposed to eat a uh, a donut during my dialogue or one of my opening scenes, and so. The mm-hmm. consequence was he had a he had a mouthful of donut when he was supposed to give his lines because because my my character was no longer there for those uh, for that time that I was out being sick. Uh huh. Oh man, that's a that's a creative way of uh, addressing that issue. And and when and when you were save money too. Yeah, ex- exactly. Again, ever pra- ever practical. I'm finding I I think more about. Um, careers in the arts and and how you create art and now in my mid thirties now is like, well that's a pretty that's a pretty practical way to solve that problem or or what have you and and when and so when you were so compared to like commercials to to doing like uh, the live stage like when you're doing the doing these parts are you like just are you like falling are you like falling in love with the the stage or the process uh, of the process of of doing the plays i was curious like uh because i remember being a high school theater kid and it like really kind of saved me in a little way like i had no direction and it gave me direction so i was curious if it was similar for for you or not uh did you go to school in the city or from elsewhere uh elsewhere i i grew up in a very small very small town in in maryland uh and then i moved to new york uh, 12 years ago so Forever an outsider, according to my wife. <laughs> oh, sure. According to your Brooklyn-born wife, who 
as we know, is discriminatory. <laughs> we're all biased. <laughs> um, we're all Brooklyn snobs. Uh, after that, I did a, a musical. I was cast as uh, Winthrop in The Music Man and did a, uh, a national tour, which was my only real taste of touring with a, uh, mm-hmm. with a show. And the, the singing was so much fun. The cast was so much fun. And that was great. I, my family came along and, and that was a real, that was a real fun summer uh, of 1988. The, uh, the musical part of it continued. I did, uh, I did a revival of Shenandoah with a uh, great actor, Dulé Hill, which you would know from Suits or mm-hmm. what was the other one? He was in the West Wing. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Just a very, just a very talented actor. Uh, had a nice family, lived in, lived in Jersey, and I was commuting into New Jersey to to do that particular show because it was a a place called Paper Mill Playhouse, um, wherever that is, where that ever that happens to be, close to the Lincoln Tunnel side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was also a musical, and and I had a a bit of fun doing it. But I was also just sort of growing up and chafing at the at the commute, which has continued to be something that I don't enjoy the commute <laughs> to Jersey, but sure. was gonna was 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 uh quick to rear its ugly head after I booked Pete and Pete later on that year. <laughs> right. <laughs> but so I had a good, you know, a good sort of introduction to all types of things. Maybe listening to many more musicals of theater when I was growing up singing along with things but then my um, introduction to the theater was uh, a few dramas in a row and I couldn't tell you which one I liked more but I did really have fun doing all of them Uh, did not work in the theater again after like 1990 something Mm -hmm. after after, uh, after Shenandoah I don't think just started working in television and doing films. Uh, 1990, it was, I was cast in Home Alone, and I also did a couple of episodes of Pete and Pete, uh, late 89 and then into 1990. So Pete and Pete was not a constant thing. It was much more sporadic and episodic at that point. So I was able to still go to school and go audition for various things, try out for features and other TV and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Pete and Pete started out as like a a series of shorts before it it became a a series, if memory serves me correct. It's true. It's true. They started as um, promos, not unlike your Keith Haring entryway into uh, Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. Um, Just interstitials between 30 second or 60 second episodes between other TV shows. And I always remember going down the street to my sister's friend's house. The McCormicks on the other end of the block to watch uh, to watch the first time Pete and Pete aired uh-huh. on a Sunday night, I, I think. Oh wow, wow, that's so that's super cool. That's so like so so like those early Pete and Pete shorts and Home Alone kind of were not too too far too far apart. It sounds like. Uh, yeah, um, we did. Um, Probably the first Pete and Pete special was, I think it was um, the Valentine's Day Massacre. And that was uh, just around, just after I had gotten back from doing, uh, filming the first Home Alone, but Home Alone did not come out yet for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And how was your Didn't experience? Until the following. Till the, till, the fo- till the following year? Yeah, you... You were saying how was my experience? Yeah, I was. I was going to ask you what was uh, what was your experience uh, filming Home Alone? Was that your first uh, like that was your first like big Hollywood feature film? It was. It was pretty big time, um, from what I could tell. Yeah, I had not been around a lot of thirty-five millimeter cameras before, and big old Panavision stuff and big lights of that nature, and uh-huh. big sets big locations, all of it. So yeah, it was, a, it was really jumping in to the deep end as far as that was concerned. But also it was a basically a you know, big ensemble cast for the most part with 
some very talented actors and uh, we didn't all have to do too much. We just really had to uh, set the scene for this family. So it wasn't so, you know, I had a few close-ups and a few, a few lines that people remember, but for the most part, it was not, it was a lot of group scenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So you can kind of more seamlessly integrate into the ensemble that way. It's true. I was working in Chicago again on the road. So it, it gave me a little bit of the flavor of that old, the musical tour, like we did a few years before that. And being out on the road was fun, discovering Chicago, eating as much pizza as possible. Uh huh. As a Brooklyn kid, I didn't know that you were supposed to uh, be snobby about Chicago pizza. So I never. I never internalized that. So I just enjoyed all the pizza. Oh yeah. I, I never, I never got that, that memo either. I've enjoyed uh, all of my, my Chicago deep dish and tavern style uh, pizza experiences. Um, since we're on this subject and this is a, a New York thing, have you ever been to lions and tigers and squares in Chelsea? I've not been to lions and tigers and squares in Chelsea. Um, whereabouts? Uh, 23rd street, I think by, 8th Avenue. It's pretty close to the the movie theater on 23rd Street. That's a Detroit style uh, place, and I had never heard of Detroit style pizza until I discovered this place. And uh, I I think it's great. It's like cheese there's baked few, into the there's crust. There's a few Detroit. There's a few Detroit uh, Detroit style places popping up, and I have had some pizza in Ohio, which I don't know has if they really have their own culture, or if they were just happy to to imitate D Detroit style pizza, but it's kind of like a large pie cut into a lot of big square slices, not really geometrically ordered like a Sicilian, you'd say. Mm -hmm. So like a bunch of square slices, almost like you're feeding a bunch of little kids. Yeah, ex exactly. <clears throat> like back in the day when they would take, uh, your class would get like a round pizza and then they would cut it into, squ into, into squares. Um, sure. Yeah. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. Square pizza is like nostalgic for, for me because in growing up in Maryland with the mid Atlantic region, there was a chain called Lido's that did uh square pizzas and, and square slices. So for for the longest time, like square was just one of my actual column A, column B when it came to, to pizza. I didn't realize it was odd until uh till later. Or atypical, I should say. I um I've come around, and now I prefer my pizza Brooklyn style, which is just cheese and anchovies. But that's it's tough to get uh, tough to get a kid to eat that. So, oh yeah, I I imagine I've still never come around to to anchovy outside of the context of a uh, of Caesar salad. Um, Interesting. I don't know if I've ever had a a proper Caesar salad, or maybe the. Like I just thought that there was like raw egg yolk in the dressing or something like that, so I just always shied away. Yeah, yeah. Is I'm... there not egg? Is there not an egg in the yolk of a Caesar dressing? Like I'm, for the same reason I sort of like shied always shied away from mayonnaise. Yeah, I feel like a proper I, I feel like a proper Caesar salad probably uses uh, egg yolk, but I think the ones I've always had probably use like um, mayonnaise or some kind of. Uh, Subst substitute because because yeah like the idea of of raw eggs unless you know you you know they're really fresh can be again calculated risk i i have a good relationship with my bacon dealer who uh who i buy um who i buy meat from at the, the farmer's market here in greenpoint and so i've been happy to get eggs from her for a long time and i know susan that you're not going to be listening to this podcast so i can say with some certainty <laughs> that I started reaching out to the Amish and getting some better eggs. And uh, I wouldn't feel uncomfortable making mayonnaise with those. Uh, maybe a Caesar salad, but I, it's tough. It's still, that seems to me just like a, an impossibly grown up thing to eat. You know, just, I was, when, you know, introduced, when introduced to the concept of Caesar salads, I was still like a bologna and cheese sandwich type of kid so oh totally it me. just never it just yeah. never made uh, an emotional entry for me 
Oh yeah, I I know exactly what you mean. I didn't like come around to salads until well until my adult years when I I thought realized I should start eating a little healthier. But uh, um, but to but to like be a, but to be a kid in Chicago like a wonderland of a pizza making the uh making a, a big film. So you do so you do Home Alone, um, and I don't know if this was probably the if you had this uh same ex same experience but was there like a moment when before home alone comes out and before it like hits as big as big as it did that was there like a noticeable change in your life in your life after after that movie came out my parents got divorced so it kind of overshadowed any uh any kind of prestige or anything like that i wasn't Mm -hmm. really thinking about that kind of in a career way but you know i kept auditioning and doing commercials and auditioning for like I did a, a soap opera or two, but not, you know, not as a, a feature, not as a continuing player or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Like um, just like under fives. You know, the lingo. <laughs> That's like the one, the one thing I, I, I recalled, I was like, I could say, I was about to say guest star. And then I was like under five, wait, it, it, <laughs> you would easily get, if I, you know, if I were a security guard, you would easily sneak past me just based on that knowledge. <laughs> This is this term. is this is dangerous information for me to to have, um, and then, well, I'm I'm sorry to hear that you you had to to go through that, um, and then, how soon after that did Pete and Pete be, uh, come become a series? Well, we made um, we made five specials in the early '90s. We did the couple of memorable ones, which is Summer Vacation and the valentine's day massacre and we did a couple more and pete and pete turned into a series in the mid 90s and 1994 was our first uh year of series production which was my uh, 11th grade Mm -hmm. so this so these are like your later high school years you're you're doing this uh this uh very acclaimed uh kids show and I've I've always been curious because I've thought I've thought about this for a while just because I um from like a, a filmmaking point of view I was curious if you could if you happen to remember what cameras Pete and Pete filmed on because I always felt like the that era of Nickelodeon show or in like Salute Your Shorts I I couldn't tell if those those looked like they were like just like uh the consumer video of the era so I was just curious if you happen to remember that well a good a good portion of those Nickelodeon shows were um, were shot on video, but we were on location shot on film. We used like an Aton 16 millimeter, I want to say an AT, something like that. But it was a it was a 16 millimeter film show, so it was a little bit more expensive for Nickelodeon. Obviously, they didn't do it directly, but they paid a production company to make it. Um, which was sort of their way of not having to sign a union contract with the crew. Mm, um, right. I don't know how close Pete Pete got to being organized or if there were any, uh, you know, sort of, I never experienced any sort of like labor disputes while we were on that show. But after uh, Pete and Pete was done in 1996, uh, a good number of the people who worked on it went on to join the various unions. Um, in New York, that's Local 52 representing, which is which I'm a member of now, which represents uh, electric grip, prop, sound, set dressing, special effects. Uh, I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out. And they'll, mm-hmm. uh, they'll resent me, and they'll resent me, but they deserve it. Gotcha, and that and that and that local separate from IATSE. No, oh, that's a part of IATSE. Look, that's IATSE Local Fifty Two, as opposed to IATSE Local One, which represents the props and stage hands electricians of Broadway. Gotcha. Oh, okay, I I I understand. I understand now. Uh, my my wife. Uh, the reason, Rias, my wife uh, went to school for my stage. Wife. <laughs> she went to school for for stage management. So I I try to I try to. And she works for a uh, a different union now, not in in show business. Um, but I try to keep all these different locals to 
to together and I, I fail every time. <laughs> um, they're, so, uh, they're interested in protecting their various fiefdoms and uh, it's the entertainment business has always been huge in New York. And I think it's, you just see it everywhere as a, as a resident of New York city, somebody's always pissed off about their parking being taken for a television production or mm-hmm. whatever happened, whatever happens to be going on or, or just so many different studios being built in the five boroughs used to be a very small part of town. And now they're just everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I know silver cup down by, uh, by a uh, queen Queensboro Plaza, but, um, I guess there's a bunch in, uh, in Brooklyn now probably. Yeah. Sure. You got over by me in Greenpoint, there's Broadway stages. Uh, it was a, a place called cinema world, pretty close to the, uh, sewage plant there by Greenpoint Avenue that I think Spike Lee put on the map back in the day, shooting parts of things there. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's other places all over this. Steiner Studios in the Navy Yard. They got a, a deal to build a similar place down by Industry City. Um, there's various silver cups. Actually, I just want to briefly put on my nerd hat and say that the consolidation in the film business is pretty troubling. One uh, particular company decided to start buying out a lot of these places. So they own, for example, Kaufman Astoria Studios and Astoria. They also own Silver Cup. They own a, they own a few others. In addition to the rental houses that rent equipment from them, it's just, there's been a bit of consolidation in a way that's, uh-huh. I mean, I have no, I really don't have sympathy for the, uh, production companies who are using them, but it's just sort of a high, high bar for anybody else who wants studio space. There's plenty of little studios as well that can appeal to other, uh, other levels of filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, they're the, the, the folks that are not quite like my level that are out, like shooting stuff with like their iPhone without, without permits, but like not quite at the like Hollywood studio level. It's true. Well, cool. so that's so that's so so PMP was sixteen millimeter. That kind of makes sense. To, that that's interesting to me because now I I I always thought that like PMP was like a like a kind of above other kids shows in, in terms of like of quality as far now as you like, know why yeah and then like it's like not too dissimilar to uh like the independent film of of that era like I think. Uh, I believe Clerks was 16 millimeter as well, even it was black and white. But um, that's that's cool that they were that you were able to do uh, to do 16 millimeter. And and PMP was shot entirely in New Jersey. Uh, almost entirely, we shot um, a few episodes in other places on Long Island in New York City, uh, maybe up closer to Westchester. But yeah, the vast majority of it was filmed in. New Jersey, as the makers decided they wanted a particular sort of white picket fence suburb to set as the backdrop against the increasingly crazy things that we did. Yeah, and like, and, and New Jersey just outside of New York certainly fits that look. That's sort of like any, this could be anywhere, but it could be where you're from as well, kid. That's sort of what I thought. I, being, being a kid watching uh, Pete and Pete, I was like, this is not quite where I'm from, but it could be. I think that's a fair reaction. Yeah, it's to me it was, you know, I was a little bit more biased because I was a city kid. To me, it was a little bit more anonymous. Or mm. It didn't have as much personality because it wasn't a place that you could walk to type of thing. But mm-hmm. it was, it was, it was the backdrop that was needed, I guess, for those, for those types of stories. Backyards, front yards, and the like. Mm-hmm. And and like a place that would have like a uh, a mysterious like ice cream man come come through back. Uh, oh sure, those kinds. I of mean, things. we had we had characters in the in the five boroughs like that, but yeah, sort of that being the only game in town for for the kids all summer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I understand. I understand the necessity of that. Oh, absolutely. And like looking looking back, like the not only did you have like Batman. On on the show, Adam Adam 
Adam West. Um, the, yeah, the Adam West. The Adam West. What do you have any like memories of, of, of him? Like would were you like would you do seeds with him and like that's Batman? I didn't have a single scene uh with Adam West. That was a very Dan Tamborelli heavy, little Pete heavy um right, right. episode called I think it was called The Last Laugh. It's about him just pranking the hell out of his uh out of his teacher. I think that's from the third season where we had um a sort of more bifurcated storylines as far as they sort of wanted to put me very heavily into puberty and chasing girls around and uh, mm-hmm. and and little Pete sort of getting into his feeling more of his Bart Simpson ness if for lack of a better word. Yeah, more more shenan- more like uh, shenanigans. Um, the one- yeah, that's definitely part of it. He had a good. Um, crew of friends by then where they could you know stay up all you you know the the night crawlers episode where they stayed up all night was a good entry point to meeting a lot of them and we just continued to go down that road of having uh offbeat kid adventures not quite they're pushing the the envelope of growing up but not in the same way as uh, as i did yeah, because because your character is because because you're old you're older. I mentioned they're like, well, let's give him more like older older kid issues that we can we can put him in with. It's true. Uh, I think the show in general is about not wanting to grow up and sort of fighting against growing up, and maybe you know me being closer. Me being more of a battled, uh, battle-hardened veteran, and uh, Danny's character being more like on the front lines of struggling against growing up. Hmm. Yeah, I, I especially remember like it, it's interesting you say that. Like when I apply that sort of uh, that sort of thought to the some of the themes of the sh- episodes, I I really really remember like um, the one where the one where you guys like are enemies for the epi- for the episode, and there's that sort of pull between the younger your the younger brother and the older brother relationship um i remember like i think there was the one where you like wiggle your ear and like you make faces at each other and then eventually you're your friends again or the prom episode i think wasn't icky pop in that one he pop was in a number of the episodes but yeah once michelle trachtenberg's character nona came in um it was great to have she she provided a ton of angles that maybe they didn't think about before but you know a big part of his friend group and then also the ability to introduce Iggy Pop as her dad was uh, the source of endless entertainment I think for both the kids and the parents of the kids who were watching at the time because they actually recognized somebody on the show uh-huh yeah same with like Michael's Michael Stipe in the the Mr. Mr. Tasty episode as as well um not too dissimilar to like the tricks that Pixar uses where like they'll have stuff that the only adults are going to get, uh, that'll fly like over the, the kids heads, but uh, a lot of stuff that'll appeal to the kid as well, kids as well. When I was a kid, uh, one of my favorite, um, animated features was the secret of Nim. And yeah, that's a great I felt, movie. I felt like that was just, uh, just had some really skilled, actors playing these parts of animals and you know animated and for some reason i don't feel like the casting of today is as good as the casting for animated stuff back then um you know that you have to have oh that's john ham you, you know you have to have certain who's a you know who's a great actor himself uh you have to have a certain um you know, level of celebrity to be able to get an animated feature off the ground, which I guess is not different from any other feature these days, or back then either. Mm-hmm. I, I maybe it's maybe it's just you know we thought ice cream tasted better when we were younger or something. Yeah, or uh, or I saw a video on on YouTube about uh, the band Weezer. I'm not I'm not sure how you feel about them, but there's like different levels of like blue album and green album people, Pinkerton people, some people who like the later stuff. It's the, were they good? Were they, were those albums really better than the other ones? Were they just young? 
like is the music of my generation real music or was I those just the most carefree times in my life like that sort of it's important to you because of exactly how old you were and the relationships you were in and the, and the context in which you heard the music for the first time I mean I remember watching like say the video for smells like teen spirit when we were on location shooting a beat and beat um episode I'm not sure that it was a uh a full half hour special yet it was probably some of the shorts that we were doing in 1991 mm -hmm. and uh and you know you just don't forget that just because of the context and the same with Weezer just a couple of years later um yeah I'm I'm blue album all the way uh and didn't really ever keep up with them I don't think I ever owned that album uh but it was still ubiquitous as far as mixtapes from people and just hearing it on the radio or seeing it on MTV when MTV still showed videos. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was gratified and still felt out of place a little bit when I was working on a, a film called Slackers. Uh, Jason Schwartzman, who played um, another talented actor, mm -hmm. who played uh, the sort of antagonist of that of that film was in a band called Phantom Planet and Phantom Planet opened for Weezer in California. And he invited us all out to see the show. And that was a lot of fun. And it was nice to see them. And I drank too much and I got sick in the parking <laughs> lot, but uh, it was, it was still um, nice to have some of those old hits to sing along to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there's something kind of like intangible about like those, those moments in the, in the, like the, stuff and what and what can be attached like music or or art can be attached to those those moments i i agree with that that can com completely as someone who just spent a lot of money on blink 182's reunion tour uh today um oh that they just announced that they were getting back together yeah yeah tom's back in the band and the i uh, i'm a member of a few like uh discords and was able to get the pre-sale code but um but in a, in an interesting an in, interesting way to kind of bring this back to to you, outside of other Nickelodeon shows of this era, I, it seems like Pete and Pete has this sort of like lasting resonance with people, especially like uh, viewers of my era. That I feel like it, it's that show really stuck stuck with them, and it also seems like I it it, it seems like you and Danny kind of like embrace that that show a little bit like you're, you're not like, I don't get the sense that you're like running from the fact that you, you did Pete and Pete. Well, we did, um, we did choose to start a podcast called the adventures of Danny and Mike. So we're definitely, uh, referring to that, which people knew us for. Mm -hmm. Um, it's been, it's been nice to connect with people to, who talk about it and let us know sort of like I said, my first memory is is going down the block to my sister's friend's house to watch it and watching it with friends and family. And uh even now I'll talk to people who tell me that they, you know, they show it to their kids, which is uh, a nice feeling. It's not something that I'm sort of ashamed of or over in any way yeah because that 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 show was really really good again like again a cut and above as far as lots of the other shows that were aimed at, at at my age range at the at the at the time and it was uh i don't know there's just something kind of like uh there's just something kind of like uniquely there was something like very unique in its weirdness you, and, and, but it was also very relatable at the same time. It's like a relatable weirdness. I, I, I mean that in the most complimentary way possible, Michael. Well, sure. You had, you had this, you know, this suburban background that we discussed earlier that people, you had this suburban background that we discussed earlier that was, you know, supposed to be sort of a stand in for every town. Um, the creators of Pete and Pete were all from uh, upstate New York, which I think of as a, a time, not a timeless place, but 
an, an old school place as far as mm-hmm. they got an NF, they got an NFL team. There used to be an industry there. So just, you know, a Northeastern post-industrial place um, that experienced some of that post-World War II boom. Yeah. Uh, and so it was um, a helpful sort of universal reference for a lot of people. I think. Absolutely. Um, and then so, so after, after Pete and Pete ends and, and you do, and you do sl- slackers, what's kind of, I was hoping you could kind of take me through that time. Cause you, you've continued to do like some film and, and TV parts. Did you hit a point where you felt that you wanted to put less focus on, on acting? Uh, what was the transition into the field you're in, the field you're in now? Um, doing electrician uh, electrician work for for shows while i was working on pete and pete um because we were making it on film there was you know lighting that had to be done and various things like that and i just started paying attention to all the stuff that was going on um behind the scenes I noticed that when I stopped working, they started working, et cetera. We all work together sometimes, but not all the time. And I just kept asking questions. I asked the actor some questions. I asked the DP some questions and just started learning the, the lighting business, I guess, at that point. Um, and the first, uh, as the first season closed, um, the grips uh, made me a a grip belt and gave it to me, which was which was very nice. Um, really appreciated that. And uh, although I didn't become a grip, um, I kept asking questions. And as the show ended, uh, the gaffer, who's the head electrician on the show, gave me uh, gave me a shot to go work with him uh, on something else. We worked oh, on a wow. couple of music videos, and then we did a uh, a feature together called Six Ways to Sunday," which I'm not sure if it was Norman Reedus's uh, film debut or not, but it was a film that I auditioned for the lead of and ended up uh, driving the electric truck on. So a real uh, range of uh, possibilities there. a lot of a lot of the crew from Pete and Pete came along. And that was in uh, January of 1997. So Pete and Pete had been finished uh, in late 96, uh, in, sometime in 96. And then, uh, and then we did this job together in 1997 and was off and running. I uh, you know, had to learn a whole lot while working, mm-hmm. uh, while driving a box truck around Manhattan and Staten Island. And... Uh, had my share of scrapes driving that truck and uh uh, yeah just kept going and actually just had a text message with that same gaffer today he's working on a job called the gilded age for hbo it was just we were just talking seeing how each other were doing oh nice that's that's uh, that's great that you uh still keep in touch that's I, i love that i'm grateful for those uh those early contacts and I will still see uh, people that I know from Pete and Pete all over the place as grips, electrics, directors, like say um, Mike Spiller, who was the uh, director of photography the first couple seasons of Pete and Pete was, uh, came out of the indie world, went to SUNY Purchase, uh, the State University of New York, where I ended up at going for film mm-hmm. school, but also um, had shot a bunch of Hal Hartley films, which I started to enjoy after I dug into some of that. He ended up as a director directing television. I saw him years later directing uh, an episode of Ugly Betty. I was working on that, just want to say 2010, 2011, like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it it is really nice to see people from back then and it being kind of a time machine. Yeah. Yeah. You, it, it's almost like, you know, you, you have this, this group comes together and makes this like almost like kind of cool, like 
again, like non-union basic ca- cable show for this upstart, for this like uh, slowly burgeoning in popularity th- th- network, Nic- Nickelodeon. And then this, everyone goes off and continues to do do things in and and create things. And I find that, uh, I I find it inspiring actually, actually, actually as, as someone who like, again, like I went to, I did the whole, the whole theater holder thing and now I have my hands in like a lot of different things uh, creatively. So I find it really cool that you're, that you're all still doing the, the damn thing. And I think I find that really uh, inspiring. I appreciate that. Um, it's, yeah, it's nice to see people that I knew as a teenager, um, see where they're going in their lives and how things have changed since then. Maybe they're marveling that I am the exact same height and look the same, <laughs> et cetera. Um, maybe they're thinking about something entirely different. It doesn't matter at all. Right. And and you went to school for, for filmmaking, but did you go, I thought I read you went specifically for documentary filmmaking. It's true. Uh, the um, We had to pick uh, a concentration when we got to... Uh, second year and and I did I wanted to uh, I wanted to make documentaries so I made my dad was passing away uh, slowly and so I went to his old firehouse and made a documentary about the fire department Mm -hmm. Um, I made a documentary about how old people drive and my project for senior year uh, researched but not produced was about uh this kid that stole the a train a kid who was a like a teenager from brooklyn who was a real just they call them buffs in various subcultures you also would have that in the firehouse people who love the fire department Uh but uh he was a real he was a real transit buff and he befriended uh either a motorman or a conductor in the subway and uh you know they got him to show him around and one day while the conductor was on vacation impersonated him and took an a train and drove it all the way to from far walkway to inwood and back and uh only got caught on the second on the second trip when he uh went through some sort of uh when he went through a red light but i used to ride the a train uh-huh time living in queens and i felt like there was a possibility that i could have been on that uh on that a train that he had stolen and that would have been my my angle on that uh that documentary oh that's really cool was this darius darius mccollum no no i'm 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 familiar with darius mccollum and i think he has a uh i think he's just has neuroatypicality in that uh in that way this was a young man named karen thomas who uh who was just a buff, which I guess is not that different from Darius McCollum, but he's, uh, he's been, he's done the damn thing, uh, like about a hundred times or more. Right. Yeah. D- Darius, uh, I, I think he might still be in a, a mental hospital right now, but he, cause he has like an under, like some untreated mental illness. So he would get out and, and take a train, get out and take a train, just kind of like get right back to door. it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Is 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 this stuff available anywhere? Uh, it's just on sixteen millimeter film. That's where I made my film. So I may, might have put one or two things on VHS, but no, I have not. Uh, my work of filmmaking is limited to one um, cross country video trip that I did in the summer following making slackers mm-hmm. uh, of just. Uh, a trip from LA back to New York. And that's on like a DV cam, not on any, not on any, uh, sure, high sure. fidelity, anything. Is there a documentary, like a, a, a sub, a subject you, you would want to make a, a full length, uh, documentary about? Cause I love this, I, this idea of you as a documentary filmmaker. Cause I feel like there's sort of a boom with them now, um, due to, to streaming. I feel like there's, a place for them now oh yeah the people want content the people really want content 
Um, yeah. No, I think I could make a feature length out of the. Uh, the people want content. I think I could make a feature length uh, documentary out of uh, the Karen Thomas story about him taking the A train. That would definitely be something I could sink my teeth into. And um, I guess there's other sort of you, you get um, you get unfortunately pigeonholed into just specific categories when it comes to documentaries and there's still because they want to put you in a category on their streaming site you know what i mean sure as opposed to there being room for more freeform stuff which there is you can you can upload it yourself to any kind of site but good luck getting uh getting the money you paid for it back yeah uh that i know exactly what you mean that's why like i feel um that's why i love i love podcasting is that it's uh entry level is barrier is is low and there's less of uh the idea that i'm gonna spend a hundred thousand dollars and never see any of it any of it back that's a possibility man yeah and are you and danny you're, still you're, where you're getting where you're sorry uh, oh, go right that's ahead a possibility because that's a possibility because of where you're getting the funding from, depending upon your subject. I mean, broadly, you could have some sort of like public interest documentaries or documentaries about what's really popping right now is like documentaries about artists, people loving that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I just saw that there's like a, a John Candy documentary coming out that Colin Hanks has something to do with. So it helps to sort of have this like famous subject and then a you know a famous backer besides that if you want it to have some any kind of platform but that should be no barrier to anybody who wants to make a documentary about something that's important to them and and we and we put things into these categories like narrative documentary and experimental were basically the three uh things you could pick at school but there's there's a lot of things in between there mm-hmm Fascinating. And are you and Danny still doing uh, your podcast? We are, and uh, we'll do a uh, we'll do a, a live show as well called Nostalgia Personified, where we'll show some old Pete and Pete clips and make fun of each other, answer audience questions, talk about the old times, um, occasionally just reveal weird secrets about working on the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes we'll dig up old commercials that Danny and I did. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, that sounds, that we've sounds cool. Good, we've had a good, um, we've had a good selection of cool guests as Danny is a bit more active in the comedy scene or just speaks to more of those people. So we've been able to pull a, a few cool comedy guests over the years to talk to us on the podcast. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I know he's done, um, my friend Lane has a show called Tinder Live. I think he's done a couple of, a couple of times. So I do know. He... Yeah, we did, we did Lane Moore's Tinder Live and actually did an incredible uh, USA Air Guitar Brooklyn Regional Finals where Danny, Lane, and I were the judges of the Air Guitar quarterfinalists. And that's actually something that I wish we had recorded on tape because we just said some great shit. That was just, it was just all improv. Uh, improvised, I guess is that word? Yes. And, and it was a lot of, and it was a lot of fun. But yeah, I am so happy for Lane that it's still going. Mm -hmm. And I just want her to find love. Uh, no, I do too. Whatever, whatever form that takes. I've seen her band. It was romance play. And, uh, and I remain, I remain entertained by, by Tinder Live. And I've never gone on Tinder. Uh, I have not. Uh, I think I made an OK Cupid profile, but refused to answer any questions. So it's just like the most anonymous mm -hmm. profile ever, and didn't check it or anything like that. So I can't say that I have that experience. But I, 
I love um, how it gives her a jumping off point to start improvising on these, uh, these absolute monsters that are putting themselves out there for her. Oh my God. Yeah. She's, she's absolutely brilliant. I have not seen her in a while, so I, I hope I get to have her on, on this soon because I think she's uh, a delight. And as far as like, again, doing tons of things, uh, I really like look up, look up to that. Cause I, I do, I do band stuff, band stuff also. So I, I appreciate anyone who does a bunch of things and excels. Um, last thing I, I want to ask, ask you about, I've, I've truly enjoyed uh, getting to, to chat with you, Michael. I am tremendously appreciative of your time. Um, I hope this has been uh, enjoyable for you as well. Um, the last thing I Thanks, Will. I have I have most of the chunking uh, style chicken prepared, and I'm just ready to drop stuff into the wok. Oh, excellent! Um, so the last thing I will ask you before the the you fire up the wok, um, what do you remember about filming a music video for a band called the X Y Z Affair? Well, sure. Uh, my friend lived just around the corner, off of the Morgan Avenue stop in Brooklyn the L train and uh, there was a few fun kids in the band I'm trying to remember Sam worked for like somebody in the city council but I just remember them cramming a whole bunch of people into an apartment around the corner from where my buddy lived and I had used and I had used to live briefly in a sublet over there and just me marveling at uh, how the neighborhood had changed in the intervening like 10 or 15 years it was probably the first time i had seen uh jason who played jason zimbler who had played uh ferg face on clarissa explains it all in quite some time mm -hmm. who was uh who was a uh, very kind a nice guy and yeah, I remember getting, there was some kind of like messy thing that happened. It was not bubbles, but maybe it was flour or some kind of like messy food stuff happened at the, uh, oh, maybe we're re recreating Nickelodeon. And so there's some kind of slime that got spread everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, there being a lot of like cute 20 somethings there as well, because uh, that's who the guys in the XYZ affair knew. I didn't really stay in touch with the fellas, but uh, that video was fun. And also probably the first time I met Mark Summers. Not sure if I had met him before, but being so confident growing up that my brother and I could go on Double Dare and, and rock the house. Uh, <laughs> it was nice to see him in person. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, I always felt like I would have done really good on double dare or uh or wild and crazy kids that was the show i really or guts i really wanted to climb the aggro crag as a kid i really wanted to do that who didn't it was it was our kilimanjaro it was it was the kilimanjaro of 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 the 90s for sure absolutely <laughs> um didn't it, and, and and i i know i didn't didn't it, did you guys also do Nick Arcade? I'm trying to rem I might have made that up in my head, but did you ever do no, Nick Arcade? No, I don't think we did, but we did get um Phil to uh we did get Phil to come on to the who hosted Nick Arcade to come on to the podcast a little bit uh ago and he was a great um he was a great guest just snappy and uh had good stories and just a really nice guy as well. That's awesome. Well, is there anything else we can plug before we get out here, Michael? We got the adventures of Danny and Mike and, uh, and nostalgia personified. And uh, you won't be able to find my, uh, my cross country video on YouTube, but it exists there. So maybe there's a little Easter egg there for people. I appreciate it. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Any listeners who can find that video, send it my way. And uh, thank you so much again for talking to me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. Enjoy Queens. I'll, I'll hold it down in Brooklyn. And everybody else, take care. Michael C. Morona. Um, watched him on TV as a kid. 
all the time and uh, got to chat with him on my podcast. Uh, what a what a what a dream! Uh, it was quite uh, quite a delight to get to chat with Michael. Um, if you enjoyed this, you should definitely check out uh, Mike's podcast with Danny Timberelli, The Adventures of Danny and Mike everywhere you get your podcasts. And if you are listening to this for the first time and think you'd know a friend who would be interested in listening to this podcast as well, you guys are my biggest advocates for helping other people find the show. I would sincerely appreciate it. Uh, You can send them to awesomedisaster.com. That has links to all of my social media. You can find me at Comic Will Carry on Twitter, at WillCarry23 on Instagram. Also has links to my band, my stand-up comedy, everything that I do is at awesomedisaster.com. And if you want to take a step to support the show or me a little bit further, you can check out our merch store as well as our Patreon, patreon.com slash awesomedisaster. I also just released a solo acoustic EP of original songs, kind of in the emo pop punk vein, called Death of Sincerity, uh, under my own name. If you go to uh, wherever you stream your music, type in Will Carry. Uh, it'll come up. Uh, that's uh, my first solo acoustic EP. Uh, if you want to give that a check, uh, a listen, I'd appreciate that. And if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, if you want to leave us a five-star rating and a review, that helps other people find the show on Apple Podcasts. And uh, I would be uh, tremendously appreciative of that and hope uh, you continue to strive for excellence in the uh, in the year that is 2022. Um, I have a lot that I'm excited about this fall. I'm looking forward to doing the uh, traditional pop punk holiday episode with my friend Paul Cohen. Uh, I am looking forward to watching the World Cup, seeing some cool performances, and uh, maintaining. Uh, I, I've been. Uh, I, I went to the doctors, and I'm I'm on the path towards um, getting getting some longstanding. Uh, uh, health uh, issues under control. So I'm I'm optimistic as I attenu- continuously try to be. And I hope you are as well. And folks, I will see you next time between awesome and disaster. Stay safe, wear a mask when needed, get vaxxed and boosted, and stomp out fascism. Take care, everybody. Mm-hmm.